Hello and welcome to the second of the lectures in week 7 of this course titled Approximate Reasoning Using Fuzzy Set Theory, a course offered over the NPTEL platform. In the previous lecture, we looked at similarity based reasoning using a visual illustration of the entire process. In this lecture, we will look into the details, the operations involved, the steps involved in performing this inference, similarity based in reasoning inference. We will also see how it entails some restrictions on the rule base being considered. So if we, we know what a fuzzy inference mechanism is, we have this input and output spaces x and y. We consider fuzzy sets coming from these two, denoted as f of x and f of y. The antecedents ai and the consequence bi come from the fuzzy spaces or are fuzzy sets on the corresponding spaces x and y. And we have a rule base which relates the antecedents to the consequence. And what we need is given an arbitrary input a which is a fuzzy sort over x, we need to find a b which is a fuzzy set over y such that b is related to a and this we do not do it in vacuum for us the ground truth that is available is in the form of these fuzzy if then rules so we have seen that fuzzy inference mechanism can be thought of as a function from the set of fuzzy sets x to the set of fuzzy sets y in the previous lecture we looked at a diagrammatic schema of the fuzzy inference itself what we would like to do is map a given input to output. If you remember the example of an air conditioner, the control system for an air conditioner, the input is the temperature and output is the fan speed. Now, this is the mapping that we would like to do. How do we like to do this? With respect to the given knowledge which, con which is con contained in the rule base. For this, we need an inference engine. We give this input to this inference engine and it discusses takes the help of the rule base in coming out with an output. But remember, largely we are discussing with, with inference engines which can handle fuzzy sets. So often it is a, there is a need to fuzzify the given input to a fuzzy set over x and then feed it to the inference engine. The inference engine then discusses with the rule base and gives us an output. Often either it could be a direct output in the form of a real number or to the output space itself or it might go through another step. It might output a fuzzy set over y which needs to be suitably defuzzified to get a value in y. So the overall function that a fuzzy inference system tries to capture is a mapping between the input and output spaces. That means it is trying to capture the function f from x to y. So now, this means the fuzzy inference mechanism can itself can be seen not just as a function from fx to fy, but as an overall function moving from x to f of x, lifting the given value to a fuzzy set on x, mapping it to a fuzzy set on y, and then defuzzifying it, mapping it to a value in y. Now, we also know that a fuzzy inference system what it does is approximates a function. We have seen this given an f from x to y. This is what we call the system function, the function that is inherent in the system, how the system operates, which mostly we do not know. We have seen one particular example. So let's revisit that. So assuming this is the function that we are trying to capture, or this is the functioning, the ideal functioning of, of a control system that is fitted to an air conditioner. This is what we have done in the previous lecture. We have taken these are the fuzzy sets as on the input and output domains and we have tried to relate these in the form of rules. So we saw that if the rule is given as if x is cool then y is slow, it does two things. Firstly, it essentially captures some local knowledge about this part of the domain. It is clear that only points that fall within the support of x are able to excite this fuzzy set cool. That means this particular rule is largely responsible and only responsible for 
this local neighborhood of the domain. Similarly, the other rules also are capturing some local, local knowledge about some part of the domain. This is one interpretation or one perspective. The second thing that we have seen is an FIS, a fuzzy inference system, covers the graph of F with overlapping rule patches. That's what we have seen. So every rule, what it does is it captures some part of the domain, some knowledge about some part of the domain, and this is how they are stitched together to approximate this function. Now this means we need to give special attention to the rule base itself and also to the antecedents and the consequence. So it means we need to <coughs> carefully choose these antecedents. And one such way to choose is to have a complete rule base. It could also be seen as an yet another classification of uh, fuzzy if then rules themselves, a set of rules. Let's quickly recall some of the concepts that we have introduced perhaps in the very first week itself. We understand what a classical cover of a set is. Given an X, a collection of subsets of X is said to form a cover if their union contains X. For instance, if X is this interval A1, B4, then these four intervals form a covering of X. But there is not a partition. For a partition, we not only need it to cover X, but we want that the pieces of the partition do not overlap. That means any two subsets from this partition, from this cover, should not overlap. Their intersection should be empty. So this is a covering, but instead if you consider these four intervals, they form a partition. It is from here we have <coughs> generalized to the case of fuzzy sets. So looking at these intervals as characteristic functions, we, we saw that it could be generalized similarly, but now with the added advantage of having overlapping fuzzy sets. <coughs> What's a fuzzy covering? It's once again a collection of subsets, but fuzzy subsets of X. Such a collection is said to form a covering on X if the union of its supports, the union of the support of its members contains X. For instance, if you consider x to be between a1, b5, the interval a1, b5, it is clear that these five fuzzy sets form a covering of x. Now, it could also be equivalently written like this. A collection of fuzzy sets on x, they form a covering. If for every element in the domain, for every x in x, there is some fuzzy set to which it belongs to non-zero membership value. That means it belongs to some fuzzy set to a degree greater than zero. Well, we have seen fuzzy covering is different from a fuzzy partition. This is how literature uh, it is interpreted as. One particular partition that has been found extremely useful is that of Ruspini partition, which says that and if you are then the collection of fuzzy sets that you have, they should first of all form a cover. And secondly, every element of X, it can belong to more than one member of the collection. But the overall membership degrees, the sum of the membership degrees to which X belongs to these fuzzy sets should be equal to 1. The moment you put this equation, it automatically implies that for every X, there exists some K such that AK of X is greater than 0, which means the collection of fuzzy sets should also form a cover. So we have seen this example earlier. So this forms a Ruspani partition on X. Well, so now, if we have a collection of AIs, we know that it forms a covering, fuzzy covering of X, if and only if the support, the union of the support of AIs contains X. Now, let's define what a complete rule base is. If you are given a set of fuzzy if then rules, the rule base, we say it is complete, if and only if, if you pick up all the antecedents, collect the antecedents, and put them together, this collection should be a fuzzy covering of X. That is when we say that this rule base is complete. So now, earlier we were picking antecedents from the fuzzy sets on X, but now we need to be careful in our choosing. So we will denote by PX a collection of sets, fuzzy sets in X, which form a covering, fuzzy covering of X. Similarly, 
by P Y denote a collection of fuzzy sets on F of Y, which may or may not form a fuzzy covering of Y. Let's go back and see how this impingence on the collection that we choose. For instance, we have seen that in, in the previous lecture that we have considered these five fuzzy sets. Now clearly they form a fuzzy covering of the input space. If this piece were missing, then it would not be a fuzzy covering of the input space. Because when you have an element falling with, between say 20 and 22, you would not have any rule being excited and for that input, the fuzzy inference system will not be able to come up with an output. So this is a fuzzy covering of the input space and you will immediately recognize from the shapes that this set of functions, this collection of fuzzy sets, they not only form a cover but they also form a Rispini partition of the input space. With this, let's move into looking at a brief history of similarity based reasoning. In the previous lecture, we have seen that the earliest practitioners, if you look into the literature, you could trace it back to two people. The first of them is Abraham Mamdani, who in the mid 70s, over a period of few years, with different works, proposed what we now call as the Mamdani fuzzy system. And almost a decade later, came Professor Michio Sugueno, who proposed <coughs> another way of uh, a fuzzy system, inferencing using fuzzy sets, which is called the TSK fuzzy system, the Tagaki Sugueno Khan fuzzy system. But these were not the only people. You will see that later on, there were many people who had proposed specific types of fuzzy inference systems. Chen in 1988, Tuxan and Zong, they proposed a fuzzy inference system called the Approximate Analogical Reasoning Scheme. Smith Magre in 1989 proposed another such scheme. Cross and Zutkam, they proposed another fuzzy inference system in 1993 called the Compatibility Modification Inference. And Morshi and Fani in 2002 proposed what they call the Consequent Dilation Tool. But it can easily be seen that these are essentially some specific cases of similarity based reasoning. Let's get into the mechanism itself. Once again, to begin with, we have a single input, single output rule base. Fx tilde is AI, then y tilde is BI, and we have n such rules. Now, what is step one? We are given an input A dash. We need a B dash, that's the output. The first step is to match this input A dash against every antecedent AI. Towards helping us in this, we employ a matching function which we will denote in the rest of the lecture series by m. What is this function? It's a function from f of x cross f of x to 0, 1. It takes the input, input a dash and matches it against every antecedent a. These a's are fuzzy sets on x. So this matching function takes these two fuzzy sets on x and gives us a value in the interval 0, 1. And this is what we call a similarity value and we will indicate it by SI, where SI is the similarity value, to value between A dash and AI as measured by U. Let's look at a couple of examples of such matching functions. The first of them has been proposed by Zade himself and the second one by Smith and Margaret. So let's look at how this matching function looks like in a particular case. Let's take a single rule x tilde as a, then y tilde as b. Let's assume these are the fuzzy sets given to us. a is a triangular fuzzy set on x, b is a trapezoidal fuzzy set on y. We are given the input a dash. Let this be the input a dash. Now what we want to do is, as step one, we want to find the similarity between a and a dash. If you use this Zade's matching function, what would the similarity be for the a and a dash that we are considering here? Well, we need to apply this formula. Visually, how would it look like? Look at this. This is essentially applying the minimum tenum on these two sets, A and A dash. So now, as we vary x over entire domain x, this is what it would be. At point wise, we are taking the minimum. So you can clearly see 
here it is 0, here it is 0. So this is again going to be a fuzzy set, that is what is indicated here, whose support will essentially be the intersection of the supports of A and A dash because of the operation minimum, essentially for any T norm here. So this is what is going to give you this part of the formula, just finding the minimum of AX, A dash X as X varies over the entire domain X. Then we need to apply the maximum of this, essentially taking the supremum of this, and that is essentially this point. So now this is essentially the similarity value is that we have. So this is what we have found out. So first step is finding out the similarity between a given A dash and the antecedent of a root. We have seen for only one row now. What is step two? Step two is using the similarity value, we modify the corresponding consequent. Each rule has a and b, the antecedent and the consequent. We have matched the a dash with a and found the similarity value si. Using this si, we are going to modify the corresponding consequent b. And for this, we will take the help of a modification function, which we will denote by j. Note that this is a function from 0, 1 cross f of y to f of y. It takes the similarity value si, which is an, in, uh, an, uh, an element of the interval 0, 1, takes b i, which is a fuzzy set on y, and gives us a fuzzy set on y. Gives you a modified fuzzy set on y, which will denote by b i dash. So b i dash is essentially j of s i comma b i. So b i dash is a fuzzy set on y. That means b i dash will take values for each of the y in the domain of y. It can be represented like this. B dash of y is j of s i comma b i of y. But notice one thing. So j takes two values, it's a binary function, s i comes from 0, 1 and we said that essentially it is acting on fuzzy set b i but acting on b i means essentially acting on the membership values taken by b i over y. So this is also a value from 0 to 1. So essentially we can use any binary function on 0 1, which means we could use any fuzzy logic connector. Now, let's look at some of the examples of modification function that have been proposed in the literature. Earlier, we saw the matching function proposed by smith margaret So, Cross and Subka, they proposed this function as the modification function. Let's look at visually how do they look like. For the moment, let us take b dash of x to be min of s comma b of x. Let's take this as the modification function. So what does it do? It takes the similarity value s and then thresholds it over b of y. So in the formula it is x but it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so we are going to use this s to threshold b of y and get a new b dash. So thresholding means essentially at this value s we are cutting it off. So this is how the modified fuzzy set b dash will look like. If you use the operation given here, b dash is min of s comma b. Let's use the modification function proposed by Pross and Sukha. It is given as min of 1 comma bx by s. Perhaps we will start with Morsi and Fami. So the function that they have proposed is b dash is s dot b of x. So immediately you see that this modification function j is nothing but that of a product. It's a product, you know, which is again a fuzzy logic connector. So now, how will it look like visually? So we are having the same similarity value s, and using this function, we want to modify the output, the consequent b. Note that s here is a similarity value, typically between 0 and 1, and product operation essentially scales the fuzzy set p. Now you will see here that the kernel of b is between these two points, so over this interval. So at the point where b of x is 1, b dash essentially takes the value s. That's the maximum value that b dash can take. So if you are using this modification function, you see that the support of b dash will be exactly the same of support of b and also b dash will be contained in b with respect to the pointwise order. Let's look at the modification function proposed by Cross and Sudcam. 
So it is given like this b dash is min of 1 by d by s. Now, once again, it must be immediately clear to you this is a fuzzy logic connective. And what is it? It is the Gaugan implication, minimum of 1, comma y by x. So instead of y, we are putting b of x here. So this is again essentially an implication which is a, which is a fuzzy logic connective. Now, when we use this modification function, how would b dash look like? So this is the similarity value s yes, and we are going to modify it based on this. Now look at this. We are looking at minimum of 1, comma b of x by s. You see here, at this point, b of y is equal to s. b of y is equal to s. Now the moment it is s or above this, on this entire interval, the membership value of every point in this interval is greater than that of s. So essentially, it is going to go above 1 and this operation acts as a threshold. So it cuts it off at 1. So you will see that in the case that we are using the Gauguin implication as the modification function, which we call it as JML here, the modification function proposed by Cross and Sutra, we find that the support of B perhaps does not change. However, B dash now contains B. So depending on the modification function that you use, the, the modified consequent B dash can either be contained in B or bigger than B with respect to the pointwise ordering. Well, this is the second step. So the first step was to find to what extent the given A dash is similar to each of the antecedents. And using the similarity value, we are going to modify the corresponding consequence B i to B i dash. The third step is aggregating all these modified consequences. Aggregate all of these BIs, which means we need an aggregation function. Once again, we denote it as G. It essentially takes two fuzzy sets from O over Y and then gives you a fuzzy set on Y. Now, note that if when you look into this, essentially once again, G is also going to act only on the membership values of BA and BJ. Essentially, it means you could still consider G to be a binary function on 0, 1 to 0, 1 which means again a fuzzy logic connective. However, note that as in the case of theta, you might have more rules than just two, which means we would like this G to be associative so that you could aggregate them and you can do it order independently. Now, let's revisit the example that we saw in the previous lecture. Now, the input given to us was 18. And we found 18 falls in the support of these two antecedents of the rules, which said that if x is cool, then y is slow. If x is medium, then y is average. So 18 degrees temperature falls in the support of these two antecedent fuzzy sets, cool and medium. Then how did we do the inference? We looked at to what extent 18 degrees belong to both medium and cool. We found that it belonged to the fuzzy set cool, the antecedent cool to degree 0.2 and that of medium fuzzy set to degree 0.8. Clearly, we have considered a Ruspini partition. So, we see that the membership values add up to 1. This was the first step. We matched and found that we took the membership value itself as a similarity value. Is it valid? Is this assumption? Is this proposition valid? We will see that yes, it is presently in a few moments. Now, taking these two similarity values, 0.2 and 0.8, the next thing is to apply the modification function. And if you look at it, what we have done earlier is we have thresholded this consequence slow like this and thresholded the average, the consequent average this way. So it is clear visually what we are doing is applying min, the min t norm as the modification function. So that's the second step, we have modified it. The third step involved taking the union of these two sets. Essentially, we apply the max operation, which is the aggregation operation here. So that's the third step, we have found out the aggregated BA dashes, the modified consequence of slow and average, and we have aggregated them. Now, however, for the 18 degrees 
temperature that the control system has sensed, we want to set the motor speed to a particular RPM. And this fuzzy set is not going to help us. We need a number. So we came up with this operation of applying centroid to come up with a value in Y. So essentially what we have done is converted this fuzzy set on Y to a value in Y. And this is the operation called defuzzification. So this is the next step that you need to apply if you want to go back to one of the elements in Y. What is defuzzification? Essentially taking the final output B dash, which is a fuzzy set on Y and defuzzifying it to a value in Y. Centroid is one particular defuzzification. There are many more which we will see during the next few lectures this week. So you could look at it as a function small g which takes fuzzy set on y and gives you a value in y. But there is one more thing to note. If you look at it, what we have given is 18 degrees centigrade, the temperature which is a real number. It is not a fuzzy set. However, we are applying fuzzy inference mechanism. So, is there something more that is happening here? Yes. Typically and often it is required that we have another pre-processing step. That is what was shown in the schemata as a fuzzifier. We often need to fuzzify a given value if it is not presented as a fuzzy set itself. For instance, if you are given an x, an element of x, we typically fuzzify it to a fuzzy set on x. For this, we would use many types of fuzzification procedure, a singleton fuzzifier, a Gaussian fuzzifier, a triangular fuzzifier. So essentially these are, this, this can be, this step can be seen as a function edge which takes a value on x and gives you a fuzzy set on x. This we call the fuzzifier. Well, what is this singleton fuzzification? Let's pick an x0 from x. Let's say this is the input that we want to give to the system and find the corresponding matching output. What we do is construct a fuzzy set A dash with respect to x0 as follows. This fuzzy set attains the value 1 at x is equal to x0 and everywhere else it is 0. So essentially it is like a direct delta function, the characteristic function of the single ton set x0. Now let's look at this visual illustration once more. What did we give as the input? 18 degrees. And now what did we find? We are actually finding the membership degrees of 18 to the fuzzy sets cool and medium. Now when you look at it like this, this is essentially the singleton fuzzy set that we have obtained by, obtained, uh, by applying the singleton fuzzy fire to the point 18. And now you see that when you are using any one of those matching functions, take for example the Zadia's matching function, we will see that at this point at 18, if you consider it to be x0, then only at x0 is equal to x is equal to x0, you are going to get a spike, the value 1. So essentially applying the matching function to this singleton fuzzified fuzzy set and any of these antecedents is going to give you just the membership value of the corresponding component antecedent fuzzy set. And that's how we have found that it is 0.2 and this is 0.8. Well, what are the other kinds of fuzzification? We could have triangular fuzzification or Gaussian fuzzification. So in triangular fuzzification clearly we put the center point to be x0 and allow the left and right sides to taper depending on how we want the fuzzification to be. Similarly in the case of Using Gaussian fuzzifier, the mu becomes x0 and we adjust the width by appropriately using the sigma value. But perhaps there is one more thing that we could see here. If you recall, we had discussed similarity relations. These are binary relations on x, fuzzy relations on x, which are reflexive, symmetric and t-transitive. Later on, we also call them as fuzzy equivalence relations or t-equivalence relations. At that point of time, we said that each row in the matrix can be looked at as a fuzzy set. That means we fix an x0 and look at the part, a particular row in the similarity matrix, the relational matrix, 
we know that it gives us a fuzzy set and we interpreted it like this rx or x naught of y is giving us a similarity value how similar y is to x naught with respect to the relation r so you could look at fuzzification itself as a process where you are building not just a fuzzy set from a point but with respect to some relation that you have in mind in the context with respect to the domain and with respect to the problem that you are handling. For instance, you might recall this was one particular similarity relation that we have used. If you put x0 here, considering this, as to, this to be the domain, then essentially the fuzzification, what you would get is the triangular fuzzification. So every fuzzy, fuzzifier essentially has some fuzzy relation behind it and it accordingly fuzzifies the point to a fuzzy set and it is not arbitrary. Well, we have seen that the general form of a fuzzy inference mechanism was given like this as a quadruple. It has this input and output fuzzy sets, the rule base and the inference engine itself, the operations that make up the inference. In the case of an SBR, the similarity based reasoning inference mechanism, we see that it has these many components. Px and Py are the fuzzy coverings on x and y respectively. We have seen for a complete rule base, it is sufficient to have a fuzzy covering on x, but typically we also have fuzzy coverings on y. R of A, B, J is the fuzzy if then rule base, where A's are the antecedents coming from Px, the fuzzy covering on x, Bj's are the consequence once again coming from Py. Now we have restricted them to come from Px instead of just fx for the reasons that we have seen before because we would like to have a complete root base. Typically in applications we would like to have a complete root base. M which is used in the first step is any matching function of f of x cross f of x to 0 1. J is a modification function which again is a binary fuzzy logic connective if you would if you would like to choose it as such. G is any aggregation function and H is the fuzzy file which takes an element of x and constructs a fuzzy set on x. G is the defuzzifier, does the opposite job, takes a fuzzy set on y, a fuzzy set over a domain and maps it to some element in that domain. Now, we could look at fuzzy inference mechanisms themselves in at two levels, specifically the similarity based reasoning. Either at the classical level, that means you are given an x dash which is coming from an x, you apply the fuzzy fire, get an a dash which is the fuzzy set on x that belongs to f of x, apply psi tilde which we have seen as the fuzzy inference mechanism, a map which maps f of x to f of y, get a b dash which is a fuzzy set on y, apply the defuzzifier g and obtain a y dash. So essentially f star is a mapping from x to y which is more like a classical function. Or you could also look at fuzzy inference mechanism as just a mapping between fuzzy sets, from the fuzzy sets on x to fuzzy sets on y. Well, a quick recap of what we have seen today. The most important point to note is that a fuzzy inference system covers the function that it is trying to approximate through overlapping rule patches. This meant we often end up considering complete rule bases and we have seen the operations, the different steps involved in similarity based reasoning. What next? We have seen that there are two important major fuzzy inference systems that can be seen as fuzz, uh, similarity based reasoning fuzzy inference systems. That of Mamdani, the one proposed by Abraham Mamdani and the Takaki Sudhinokan fuzzy system. We will look into these two and also we will take the aid of MATLAB, especially the fuzzy logic toolbox in MATLAB to see how to build the rule base, how to build a fuzzy inference system which can approximate any function that we are considering. But in the next lecture, we will specifically look at Mamdani fuzzy systems. Once again, a good resource for the topics that we have covered in this lecture are the books of Pachino and Yurkovich, that of C.T. Lin and George Lin, and also that of Professor Piaget. Glad that you could join us in this lecture. Hope to see you soon in the next lecture. Thank you again.